Okay, good afternoon. Ooh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Purser, GW4SA Chef. I'm RSGB Company Secretary. And occasionally, I get to chair sessions and I get to chair this one. Um, Graham said, I can give you a choice of two, FT8 or this one. Well, it didn't take me long to decide that one. Uh, I have some announcements to make. Um, I have to thank the previous speaker if they're still present. No, I think they've gone. Uh, the fire exits, you know where the fire exits are now? Yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, no recording of lectures is allowed, either video or audio, but this is being recorded and will be on YouTube at some point in the future. Please turn off your mobile phones. Um, I'm particularly pleased to introduce our lecturer, Jenny Bailey. I've known Jen, Jenny for 40 years, we think. Something like that, yeah. Uh, from the expeditions to the Isle of Man, and I think we've kind of followed one another's careers since then, pretty much. She via Blue Box yep. as an apprentice, via being Lord Mayor of Cambridge City Council. Yes. And she's now a senior engineer with Ofcom, and she gets to fly these interesting looking toys. Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. So, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about. Um, and hedge measurements and radio measurements using uh, using drones. What we plan to cover are the um, well, the, the, the probably the most important thing, unfortunately, which is the legal operation of drones in the UK. Um, something about drone qualifications. So, if you do decide to go for a commercial license and um, try to, uh, um, um, if you want to be paid for doing drone operation, they will need a commercial license for this. So, there's a little bit of information about that. We cover quite a lot of the drone architecture, um, and then we move on to um, one of the operations I did for, uh, for Ofcom, um, uh, uh, some um, uh, radio field measurements at uh, the Beel building research establishment. And then we'll move into how to move that into an amateur context so that um, we have a relatively cheap way of doing antenna radio measurements using drones. So, drone operation in the UK. There is a really good site that the um, CAA have uh, created, um, Drone Safe. If you're gonna fly a drone in the UK, please have a look at this site. It's got a nice, simple introduction to what you can and can't do with a drone in the UK in order to keep yourself safe, pilot safe, and obviously the general public safe. So this, this is um, a nice, easy way to look at that information. If you want a more complicated way of looking at that, um, the things that you will get used to, especially if you write, start writing your own operations manual, which you will have to do if you come commercial, is um, CAP 722 in Navigation Order um, 2016 with the update for 2018. You do become quite familiar with these documents. They have all the information about flying drones in the UK, what you are and what you're not allowed to do. But a very quick run through it, you are allowed to go up to 400 feet and out to 500 meters from your um, location. And you have to love the CAA for their um, two different units of feet and, uh, and meters, historical reasons. Um, you also have to remain within visual line of sight of the drone. Now, visual line of sight of a drone, something like uh, this one, 500 meters out, this is actually quite difficult to see. This one, not so. Um, you can see that 500 metres out, but you have to maintain um, visual uh, line of sight. You also have to stay away from other people's houses. These are houses that you have no control over, i.e. you haven't brief briefed the occupants, you haven't got permission to fly within 50 metres of their house. And 150 metres of built-up areas, so that will be major conurbations. And those values change as you go from um, 0 to 7 kilograms you can do as an amateur, 7 to 20 kilograms you can get as an exception, um, and then these, uh, these um, distances increase. And of course, if you're um, flying a drone in the UK, it's worth having insurance. And there's a really good way of getting drone insurance that will cover you for any anything you're likely to do, and that is to go with the um, British Model Flying Association. And I think it's about £34 for a year's coverage, and that will give you all the coverage you need. Um, the downside of um, um, drone flying, of course, is uh, you can see the propellers on that drone. When they're moving at speed, they are actually very dangerous. Um, 
I haven't put any pictures of injuries on this talk, but you can see lots of pictures of injuries on, uh, on the internet. They're very nasty if they'd ever get into the wrong place amongst the public. So hence, safety, drone insurance, very important. Now, if you want to become qualified, so um, um, as part of uh, my job, I've become qualified to, uh, to fly drones for, um, uh, for profit. Um, so anybody who's flying and being paid for it does need to get a qualification. Um, it costs round about two and a half thousand pounds. Um, that's not including the drone. Um, and then, of course, you have to maintain that. You have to fly for two hours every three months. And that was a little bit of a burden. But actually, unless you're flying every day, you do get out of practice. That two hours is really important. You notice it every time you do it, that you get used to your checklists, you get used to the drone again, you get, different get used to different weather through the year. On top of that, um, you have to do the CAA re renewal every year. Um, that's about £185 a year. Um, you have to put your pl pilot log in there to set so they can show that uh, you're doing the hours. So, what does training involve? Well, we had two days of flight training, one and a half days of ground school, and that was just covering the rules, CAP 722, etc. And then a day, sorry, half a day of exam, which you have to pass at quite a high level. Um, and then a um, half a day of flight exam. And the flight exam, luckily, was customised. We, we went with a company called the Aerial Academy, um, and they customised it. Because we're not doing very much photography, most people do photography with drones, we tend to do slightly odd things. We'll tend to fly a, um, a particular route, or we'll just fly the drone to 400 feet and leave it sitting there. So our, our operation was quite unusual. So we were tested much more on um, flying to different waypoints rather than flying to a certain location, taking a photo. The other thing the tester will test, they will test your drone. So you know, you have to know how to program your drone to do various safety things. So for instance, if the drone loses radio control contact, second, <laughs> one radio controller, if that goes out of contact because of radio interference, low battery or something like that, the drone will pause for a certain amount of time, then it will go up to a predetermined height that you program to get over any local trees, and then it will come and hover, hover over the spot where you took off from, it will land on that spot. It's a good idea not to stand on that spot. So um, quite often it will put down the landing gear as well, so that's, uh, that's all good. You have to program the drone to do that, the instructor will turn off your controller at some point during your flight. It's unnerving. So that will give you 0 to 7 kilograms commercial operation. If you want to, um, to do uh, 7 to 20, you need a heavier drone, and you can be tested on that. So if you want to work outside the envelope, say um, you want to do 1,000 feet um, for doing some tests. Um, you can do that, again, with CAA's permission. You have to negotiate with, CNC, with this CAA for an um, operational safety case. And this will be an additional document to your operations manual you have created as part of your uh, um, um, license with the CAA. And um, it will have things like anything to mitigate the extra risk you're adding in by going up to, say, 1,000 feet. You can have other, other operating safety cases, being closer to the public, um, being outside visual line of sight. So you might have two pilots, and they t take it in turns to hop the drone along, say you were surveying a railway track or something like that. You need more than 500 meters. Um, so if you want to do 1,000 feet, the CAA will probably say something about geofencing the drone to um, within, say, 10 meters of the takeoff point. So you can't go outside that. It stays very much within that tunnel going up. They might ask you to have a Coulomb counter or something, some very accurate way of measuring the battery level. The, um, the battery normal voltage measurement just looks at the terminal voltage under load. It's not great. So Coulomb counter measures the current in on charge, measures the current out on discharge. It will give you a much better idea of how much you've got left. 
And of course, if you're going above your 400 feet, you'll need a NOTAM um, notice to uh, airmen that will warn other pilots that there's drone activity in that area. They should look at that before they plan their flight and avoid the area. So, drone hardware. Yeah, there was. There was actually some drone hardware during um, World War II, Operation Aphrodite. They um, loaded up B-17s and something else. Plain people will know all this. But um, with a lot of high explosives, and they had radio control equipment. They had two television cameras feeding back the ground view and the pilot's view. Um, it wasn't a great success. They had all kinds of problems. The amazing thing is the pilots took these planes off and then parachuted out. The people were so brave. That's just remarkable. Anyway, yeah, we're not doing that. Um, we <laughs> moved on to, um, so 1960s, I think Phil would say, sort of, um, um, they, there was valve uh, radio control stuff, 27 megs, 35 megs, people remember all that stuff. Um, this was basic um, joysticks straight to, um, straight to controls. There was no flight controller in the way. You had to genuinely fly it. And that pretty much moved on to radio-controlled helicopters. People will probably remember these. I was able to fly these for over two minutes without crashing them. But, um, yeah, not much more than that, I'm afraid. I was th there's some people who were very, very good at these. I was never one of them. It was always disappointing that I could not do any proper surveying with these. Luckily, they brought out drones. So... You can see that we've got various drones along there. E everybody should recognise the, um, the Phantom series. Um, there's various other uh, drones, the Inspire. And of course, you have wonderful things like uh, that, which is the, uh, the Mavic. And that's great for taking on holiday because you can just unfold it and fly it. It's brilliant. It's got some slightly creepy features, like you can set it up to recognise your face and it will follow you as you walk along. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but what you do have, um, for f th th those are really, none of those are really any good for doing radio surveying because there's no way really to clamp on any test equipment. So we have much more um, um, structural things like um, the 550 and the S900 over there. And you tend to buy these as an airframe. These ones are ready to fly. These will come as an airframe. And then you buy the electronics to, uh, to go with it. Oh, one thing worth noting is that we specifically chose a hexcopter rather than a quadcopter. If you lose a motor, so for instance, when you haven't done the, the nut up properly on your 550 and the prop flies off in midair, it doesn't crash. It's really worth knowing. It's quite difficult to land, but it's safe. Whereas if you lost one on these, they would come down. Drone hardware. Um, so this is the electronics you tend to get, and th th it's actually quite complicated. So you have, um, we obviously don't use the camera or the gimbal control, but everything's based around the flight controller. The thing that has made this um, new hobby very possible is the miniaturization of sensors and processing power you've got from the mobile phone industry. So for instance, um, GPS, um, inertial uh, uh, measure measurement unit, um, the uh, GPS stuff, um, magnetometer, all of those have come out of the mobile phone industry, been, mi been already miniaturized and low-currented, so they um, are very easy and very cheap to put inside a drone. So um, we have things like, I say, GPS and um, in inertial measurement unit going to the flight control. You have a 2.4 gig receiver for your radio control, 2.4 gig telemetry, coming out, that goes down to a separate PC, we'll cover that later. Um, the on-screen display, now that's really useful if you're doing video downlink on 5.8 gigs. We don't especially do that, but it also carries a very good logging ability. So if the drone does something odd during your, um, um, during your testing, you can go back, look at the flight logs, see exactly what was going on. So the OSD is very useful for that. And then we obviously have the battery power management unit and the um, controllers for the motors. So effectively, when you're flying a drone, you are just now using the joystick to position the drone where you want it in the sky. The drone's actually doing the flying, which means it's all very easy and possible. If you let go of the joysticks, it just stays there. It's great, as long as you've got GPS. So 
So this is the uh, electronics for the flight controller. Uh, this is particularly the um, A2 DJI electronics. Uh, we chose this eventually because it seemed to have a harder radio receiver that was um, better at um, coping with interference. Um, and it had a um, um, more, ex sorry, it had extra features such as point of interest flying. So this was for specifically for an antenna analysis. It allows you to hover over a point of interest, an antenna, go out to say 20 meters, put over the joystick, hard right or hard left, and it will fly a perfect circle around it. Perfect for doing antenna analysis. As I said, there's an LED on the back. This is actually more useful than it sounds. Um, this gives you all kinds of information. So I think on, uh, on that drone over there, you can see a sort of um, an LED on there. That is remarkably bright. Out at a few hundred meters, you can still let's see that LED flashing. When you first turn the drone on, it hasn't got any GPS. It takes a while to get satellites. It will flash three times to say no GPSs, two times to say more than five or whatever. Once it's got a home lock, it flashes green, and you know that it's marked the spot on the ground where it's going to come back to. So that gives you lots of useful information without referring to the other electronics. Oh, it also allows you to know, gives you feedback when you calibrate the drone. The first time you use the drone, um, you need to calibrate the magnetometer. We've come a cropper on that before, and this is now in our ops manual. We do this every time we um, put some new equipment on. So on the first flight of the day, you will calibrate the magnetometer. You will pick the drone up, hold it in a circle, or, or, or roll it in a circle, and that will calibrate it. We had a, um, a slight problem when we wanted to generate a signal from the drone to fly around a direction-finding piece of uh, equipment. And so we put on a um, two-way radio, just tie wrapped it on the top. The drone took off, and you could tell it was very upset, so we, la we landed and looked at it. And of course, the speaker in the two-way radio interfered with the magnetometer. You always calibrate before you fly with some new kit. So, some drones are Wi-Fi controlled, and 2.4 gigs is Unpredictable, because it's a non-licensed band, all kinds of people could be on there, or you could have a local leaky microwave or whatever. So it's really not a great band, especially in a congested area or an area where there's a big crowd of people. For instance, during the London Olympics, the, um, the stadium, when they had the opening ceremony, 2.4 gigs was unusable because people were uploading cameras, uh, sorry, pictures from their cameras, and then sending them out. And it just went into sort of full automatic back off, and nothing was getting through on 2.4 gigs. If you'd had a drone in the air at that time, it would have automatically come home. So um, we've got radio control on 2.4 gigs. As I say, telemetry on 2.4 gigs, both up and down, both of those. And normally you've got um, video on 5.8 gigs if you're using the video. On some DJI devices, I think on the Phantom, the um, video and the telemetry radio control are the other way around, but it's DJI for you. Analog. It is analog video, yes. Yeah, it's those um, rather wonderful, cheap um, Chinese um, video transmitters you can get and work amateur 5.8 gig stuff, so to be experimented with. So you can put some drone software onto your laptop connected to the telemetry unit, and that will give you another a number of features. It will give you the drone height, battery voltage, GPSs, signal level of the telemetry, um, yeah, height above ground, virtual speed. Those are all really useful, even though the pilot doesn't tend to be looking at the laptop when they're flying. You tend to have your sort of co-pilot or um, somebody watching, keeping an eye on this. But it also gives you other things. Um, we, although we've never used it, click and go to automatically take off and set off on a, um, a pre-ranged run. More importantly, a, um, a go home. So if you do lose control from, say, the uh, um, remote control, you have got other ways of connecting to it, like, uh, like on there. It will also, if you set up a waypoint, what we tend to do is, is um, take off, make sure it's stable, upload this set of waypoints, and then fly it. It will show you where you are along the waypoints. So it's very good for giving you feedback on what the drone is doing. 
It also keep a flight log, and you can replay that flight log later with less information, but it does give you enough information to see what happened. So for one of the jobs we were doing, we wanted to um, do effectively 100 metres by 100 metres field strength measurement and um, have effectively a, a measurement every 10 metres, um, over 100 by 100 metres. We used to do that using a push-up mast, and it took a long time to go every 10 metres, push the mast up, do a measurement, bring it down another 10 metres. Um, by using the drone and misusing the foot photometry tool, you can persuade the drone to, um, to do a 100-meter um, run and then move 10 meters and do a 100-meter run back. And what you're doing effectively is changing the, the camera parameters at the height you are, say, 20 meters high. So it will effectively do a complete set of photographs of a field, but, say, 10 meters apart. So the software you saw in the previous page will allow you to adjust it to do your 10 meter grid. So of course the other big thing that we have are the LiPo batteries and everybody's heard how um, safe LiPo batteries are. Uh, this is the one that we normally use for that drone, um, 12 amp hour, um, uh, 6S, which means six cells. Um, charge voltage of about 25, 26 volts, um, dropping down to 22 volts. Um, this should give us, in theory, 15 minutes of flight time. But the reality is that that would be 15 minutes just hovering at two, meter, two meters. If you want to go up to 400 feet, we can only guarantee to stay up there probably for about five minutes. So depending on the maneuvers you're doing, depending on the temperature, uh, the sort of speeds you're doing, you'll eat into that 15 minutes. We do like to land with greater than 25% charge left as well, just to give us um, some uh, um, um, contingency just in case. Also, if you store these batteries, if we're not going to use them for a few days, you tend to take the charge down to 40, 50%, something like that, and then it will store like that. If you don't discharge them to do that, it will start to, um, to puff up and become dangerous. So for instance, this drone has got some software built into the battery. The battery, if you haven't used it for a couple of days, automatically discharges itself down to about 40%. And um, the other problem with uh, LiPo batteries is uh, they catch fire. Again, loads of videos on YouTube of on a light LiPo batteries. You should keep them definitely in a um, LiPo bag um, pretty much stay near to them when you're charging them so you can see what's going on. And um, store 60% full, 50% full. So, oh, weather. Yes, weather. If you've got, obviously, fog, rain, snow, hail, that sort of thing, you're going to be struggling with visual line of sight. Um, also, any... Certainly that drone won't be great in water because um, all the electronics are open, so you really wouldn't want to fly that with any precipitation of any kind. Um, in the dark, again, you might have to create an operational safety case for that. And in cold, your LiPo batteries are not going to work as well. I've got an electric car. I can do 90 miles in the summer, 70 miles in deep, deep winter. The drone is exactly the same. It, um, its capacity goes down as it gets colder. And of course, wind, and this is one of the biggest things we're up to. We wouldn't be able to fly today, it'd be too windy. We tend to say, um, we go out and measure with the um, um, anemometer, um, and if you see anything over 16 miles an hour over about a minute, then you shouldn't fly. But of course, the other method is the anemometer falls over if it's too uh, windy. So um, it's just extra risk you don't need, and you're always trying to mitigate risk uh, flying these. So the payloads we tend to use, um, I've flown with um, the protocol analyzer up there. That will look at um, cellular transmissions, um, um, 4G um, down to 2G and other stuff. And that will keep um, the data on board. It's about two kilograms, including battery. It took us right up to capacity on the drone, which is a takeoff weight of 8.2 kilograms. So it was right on the edge. And the drone, you could tell the drone was not 
very happy. So, um, but we took that up to 400 feet to do some measurements. You can send a signal source. These signal sources are great for, again, testing DF arrays. But my favorite uh, device is the CRFS spectrum analyzer. Um, I used to work for, for CRFS, so I know my way around the back end of that. But it comes with a GPS. It logs the data to a USB stick, and it's got a 3G modem built in, so you can actually see it, see what's going on as you're flying. Antennas, well, this really depends on the job you're doing. So you want to, well, obviously, you want to keep it as light as possible. That's, that is the overriding thing. Um, we're trying to do some band two measurements at the moment, and it's quite a large antenna, a full-size band two dipole. It's got a lot of spring to it. It's actually not the weight. And not necessarily the size, it's just the springiness at the moment, so I'm sort of trying to get around that. But uh, you tend to design the antenna specifically for the job, or you can buy one of these ultra-wideband antennas. But it'll come down to weight, frequency, polarization, the bandwidth you're after. If you're using, say, a 0 to 6 gig spectrum analyzer, you might um, want one of these ultra-wideband antennas. But generally, we're building our own. So, the job we did for Ofcom, um, what we wanted to do was to validate the propagation model for um, when we sold off 800 megs and selling off 700 megahertz, um, moving the television transmitters closer together. We'd assumed that there was no correlation between two transmissions at 90 degrees to each other. It was a safe bet. It gave us extra, um, um, again, contingency in the planning. But in order to make the planning more accurate, we needed to measure that variation over a load of rooftops um, with two interfering transmissions. So against 100 by 100 grid, but it was over the top of rooftops at the height of antennas. And there was very few other ways to do that test apart from with a drone. We considered um, cherry pickers, people with poles. None of these would have worked. So we had two transmissions next to each other on channel 36 with a test and development license, and we transmitted a kilowatt from each of those um, um, transmitters, transmissions, or trans sorry, transmitters a couple of miles away from the site. And we also used Santa Heath Crystal Palace. So what we wanted was an abandoned estate of houses, because of course we can't have people there if we're flying. The other test we wanted to do was to look at what television signal, television antennas actually do when they're installed, which can be very different to their polar plot before they're installed. So we had a number of television antennas installed, and we flew around it using the POI uh, method. So if you remember the restrictions we got, we have to be at least 50 metres from nearby buildings, um, anything that we have control over, any security people or people on site that we briefed are f absolutely fantastic. Public, we have a bit of a problem, and we have to be away from built-up area. So what we ended up going for is a place called the Building Research Establishment, just north of London. And this is a great site. We could take it over for the weekend, um, but it does have a number of restrictions. One of the problems was the M1. You really don't want to be flying right next to the M1. Uh, the mainline railway, um, they're really, really unhappy if you get drones anywhere near that. And of course, we've got some people living quite close to us, but more than 150 metres away from where we intended to fly. So it was actually quite a constrained site. Um, and the nearest airport, I think it was about six kilometres away, Elstree Airport. And again, we phoned the uh, air traffic control just to say this is what we're doing. They're fine. So on site, these are the sort of houses we flew over. Now, the building research establishments have all kinds of sensors in these houses. They look at different methods of construction and insulation features and stuff like that. And this would be a lovely site, but the, the problem for me was the cellular tower in the, back in the backyard. And I really didn't want to fly anywhere near that because, um, well, obvious reasons. Um, our customer was insistent. So we thought what we'd do is to test the drone right in front of that um, um, transmitter, but we'd actually bolt it to a piece of wood and stick it up on top of a 20-metre mast. And um, it did fail, actually, because there was a number of possible failure modes. We thought we might lose GPS due to blocking. We thought that we might lose radio control due to blocking. 
neither of those were a major problem because it would safely come back. But if RF got into the um, um, inertial measurement unit or the flight controller, it would potentially crash. And um, it's 10,000 pounds worth of analyzer on the bottom of it, two and a half thousand pounds worth of drone. You really don't want to crash it. So we put that up in front of the tower and we found that there was interference to the radio controller. So we ended up upgrading to the A2 that you saw. That was a much better receiver. After all the tests we did, it was absolutely fine when we put it in that location. So that was the drone fully laden. Got the spectrum analyzer on the bottom with the um, uh, USB stick with the script on it to say what to log and the logging. We did have a camera on the front, even though we ended up having that pointed down in the end. And of course, you can see the GPS. You can also see the antenna we used, which I think I've got a little bit further on the next page. That's it. Yeah, so we, we tried lots of different things. We went to a commercial company, and they wanted to charge us a lot of money for something very heavy. Um, and we're trying to look at, we want, wanted to be an omnidirectional antenna, but for horizontal, and that's always difficult. So um, I'd had a 50 meg big wheel. I thought, well, let's try and build one for this. And we got it OK. But unfortunately, you can see that we've still got a few dBs of variation. It's, sorry, it doesn't come out very well on there. But we did end up with probably two or three dBs of variation as it went around the big wheel. We never got it within our half a dB that we wanted so the drone could rotate and still be a reasonable level of calibration. We did send the drone off to MPL and they calibrated the whole thing. So we do have the spectrum plots for what it's possible to do. I say, I think it's this one that shows the drone as it's rotated and the gain that you're picking up. But the biggest problem was off the edge of the petals. Each petal on the corner tends to dip a little bit. So the operation was supposed to be that you saw that we could do the 100 meter grid. We would fly the 100 meter grid backwards and forwards, turn it on 90 degrees, do it east west, and then we'd get a, a huge amount of measurements, probably one measurement every three meters. Um, and that was plenty enough for this, um, um, this test. And we did two sets of measurements one listening to Crystal Palace Sandy Heath, one listening to the transmissions on channel 36. And we're going to do autonomous flights. So we practiced all this at Baldock, where we work, and we came up with some problems. Sorry, excuse me. The first problem was that as the drone goes down the track, it then rotates 90 degrees to head downwards, 90 degrees to go back. It always points forward when it flies. And this was an issue with our non um, circular, sorry, no, not circular, non calibrated um, big wheel antenna. And in the end, what we had to do was to fly that grid manually, but instead of um, it rotating at each end, we would fly down sideways, backwards, sideways, forward, etc. And that meant you could keep the same aspect of the antenna pointed at the two transmissions. So it was a calibrated measurement, um, but we had to fly this manually. But it worked out okay. Now, the second one was a bit more curious. We found at the end of each of these, even when we're doing it manually, the results went a bit odd. Um, they dipped, the signal strength you're seeing dipped. And that's because as you start to fly, you'll accelerate forward. The drone will do that to go forward. And of course, I know that our antenna isn't quite as sharp as that, but it was sharp enough to make a difference if the drone tilts. So we had to be very gentle, accelerating, deaccelerating, and we had to fly with no wind. We were very lucky that we didn't fly with any wind. So the results we got, that was one of the, trans one of the um, um, manual grids that we did, uh, left, right, north, south. So we got that about right. That was our flight profile. So we kept it at a fairly constant height. And you can see, and this was the really good outcome from this project, that there is some very good correlation between the two signals at 90 degrees to each other. So this was a really good outcome, and this, is, this information has gone back into the uh, propagation model. We also got data from the, propagation, sorry, from the antenna plots when we flew around the antenna. 
And um, this is quite complex to process, because effectively you've got a load of latitude, longitude, and then dBm at particular frequencies. So if you plot those, you have to do a fair amount of geometry to turn that into that polar plot. But you can do that. That's all doable. It's just effort. So if I can quickly go to a video. How long have I got? Oh, yes. I won't show too much of this because it's long, but... So there were the two transmitters that we were doing, or, uh, transmitting on. Again, these are all experimental houses that we're flying around of different types. Just before you actually do the operation, you test out effectively the control surfaces just to make sure you've got full control over everything. And the lovely thing about this drone is that when you raise the undercarriage, it is glorious. You can see how close we were to the um, cellular tower. We were generating a, a signal from the um, television antenna on the house and we were measuring it on the drone, yes, absolutely. I don't know if I'm not fan. I could work it out for you, or so I could find it out for you, but I don't know if on top of my head. Yes. At one point, we had to fly two drones in order to get some of these photos. So we had one drone doing the operation and a second drone um, videoing the, uh, the first drone. In fact, it was three operators. It was two people operating the drone and one person on the laptop and also being lookout. What you tend to be doing is keeping a lookout for any planes coming, any public coming, so you always need a lookout. Right, so I think we're moving on with time, so what I'll do is I'll stop this. And... Go back to that. Right. So how would we do this in an amateur context? See if I'm okay for time. Yes, I am. So uh, we've, we've used it for a couple of things. The first one, over on the left-hand side, you can have an instant 400-foot mast. Who would not want an instant 400-foot mast? The thing you can't do is transmit from it, but to receive on it um, is absolutely fantastic, and it's really impressive what... 400 feet of height gives you. So for instance, on 10 gigahertz, this is one of Bernie G4HJW's 10 gigahertz receivers, and we coupled the audio down the audio of the 5.8 gig video downlink. So we weren't uh, unofficially transmitting, we were actually just using the 5.8 gig downlink. And you could hear a number of beacons um, on the band, and they came up in signal strength as they uh, obviously went up. Um, the other thing that I've tried to do, but I haven't succeeded yet, is to, is to pull a line over a tree for rigging a long wire antenna. Now, on this drone, I don't know if it's still on here, I had a drop pod. No, I must have taken it off. But it's a remote control release, just in case something gets snagged. So that must be a, uh, it's probably going to be a job for next summer or something. But I've certainly promised an, a fellow amateur that I will try and drag a, um, a line over his tree for him to rig a 80-metre uh, antenna. Um, this was some measurements we did um, on some other base stations. And this shows you how important, so this is effectively signal level with uh, versus um, height. And it really is the first 20, 30 meters that makes a difference. Obviously, that will depend very heavily on clutter, um, if you're amongst buildings, where you are, um, with the geography around you, if there's hills around you. But 
once you get above the clutter, actually the extra few hundred, or yeah, few hundred feet doesn't make that much difference. So um, signal versus height is really useful to get you above the clutter. So if we're going to do an antenna measurement, we could do something very similar to what we did um, at the building research establishment. We fly around the antenna at its, um, at its height to see what, uh, and just measure the signal strength as you go around it. That's all fairly straightforward. Um, again, this is using the, p the uh, point of interest programming. So you just say, here's the point of interest, 10 meters out, fly around it, come down, take the results. You could also look at the um, polar plot, the vertical polar plot effect, sorry, the, the vertical plot, just to see how tight the um, transmission is from, say, a vertical. And again, you want to be something like 10 wavelengths out to get into the far field, then you can do that measurement. One of the problems with the uh, previous um, Hobbit beam antenna flying around it is you might get ground reflections. And the way to avoid that is just to do a grid over a tra an antenna that's pointing vertically upwards. And that will give you a much better um, um, plot of what the antenna is doing, and it will take away a lot of the ground reflections. So the payload you could use for that, and this is what we've set up here on the little drone, uses an SDR play, um, a Raspberry Pi, which is somewhere. So we've got SDR play Raspberry Pi, that's got a GPS filter into it, and it's taking the power from the drone with a, a converter down to 5 volts, a switcher. Um, it's using the SOAPY SDR remote, so this is using um, uh, the SD card that the SDR play people have created. Put it into SOAPY remote mode, and then you use the 5.8 Wi-Fi link to go down to a Wi-Fi router, and can run Cubic SDR on the laptop, and you get to see what the spectrum analyzer at the drone sees. So you'll get a plot that looks very much like that, but it's actually using the receiver up at 400 feet. So it's just such a fantastic thing. And you can decode audio, etc. If you want to do something a bit more advanced, because I'm starting to run out of time now, um, you can actually write a little bit of code. But because the SDR play's got a nice API, GPS has got relatively good Python drivers for it. You effectively do a FFT in the GPU on the Raspberry Pi. You can get frequency level out of it. NMA, de NMA decode, you can get location out of it. And that can all be written to a local CSV log file. Something like lat, long, um, height, level. And that will give you all the information to plot an antenna profile. The only other thing to take account of is the drone antenna. If you make that too narrow um, um, bandwidth, not bandwidth, if you make it too narrow, you'll end up, as you go below the antenna or above the antenna, you'll start, the, the profile of your drone receiving antenna will start to add in to the level you're seeing. Ideally, we'd have an, uh, um, a, uh, um, Thank you, yes. <laughs> One of those would have an isotropic radiator, but um, unfortunately they don't exist. So hopefully that's been useful. Um, if you've got any questions, um, I'll probably be after some coffee. Yes. Um, can you just explain what limitations there are for us um, to be able to operate one of these sort of software 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 a drone that off. Yeah, of course. You of course, yes. Um, again, if you go back to that um, first slide, the, uh, the drone safety information will tell you, but it comes down to you're allowed to take off from your own land, you have to stay more than 50 metres away from somebody else's house, and you're not allowed to be in built up areas. You have to stay visual light of sight, but if you are able to fly over, say, farmer's field, you can do that as long as you're not going anywhere near buildings. It's very much like the principle of an aircraft can fly over other buildings. You don't have to own it, but you do have to own the place where you land and where you take off from. That has to be 50 metres from the public. Can we still get to 400 feet? Can we still? Can we still get to 400 feet? You can, yes. So we don't need anybody's data? No. 
but it's always nice if you're anywhere near an airfield. Obviously, you shouldn't really be anywhere near an a, 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 a controlled zone. If you're anywhere near an airfield, they actually don't mind you phoning up and saying, "This is what I'm about to do." Cambridge Airfield have been fantastic, and the ones down at Elstree have been great. Yet we have military people flying over Bulldog. That's why we have a spotter. They're usually below 400 feet. Yeah. And our spotter will say, incoming aircraft, and we take the, the drone low. In fact, that's one of the things that you'll get examined on in your flight test, is whilst you're flying, the instructor will say, the instructor will say you've got an incoming aircraft, you make the drone safe. It's all about safety. Right, we have run out of time now, folks. Uh, Jenny, absolutely fascinating. Perhaps we'll thank Jenny in the usual way.